Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future in Review podcast, where we have in-depth conversations about emerging technologies and their impact on the next five to ten years. I'm your host, Barrett Anderson, COO for Future in Review and Strategic News Service. And on this podcast, I interview visionaries, researchers, and leaders across fields like AI, biotech, computing, and more. So together, we're going to be discussing where different technologies are heading in the coming years and decades and explore the potential impacts to society of those technologies, both positive and negative. I am very excited today to be joined by our guest, Taylor Lorenz. Hello, Taylor. Did I get your last name right? Hi. Yes. Yeah. I've had, yeah. I've had, the, I've had the, the potential of, um, it's, it's really great to have you here. I, I've, I have accidentally mispronounced people's last name before, so I just wanted to make sure I got that right. <laughs> Um, Taylor is a columnist no, no at the Washington Post covering technology and online culture, and she is also the author of the forthcoming Extremely Online, which will be out October 3rd. She is joining us this year at our Future in Review conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. Uh, that will take place November 6th through 9th in Los Angeles, California, for a conversation about technology, addiction, and mental health. So welcome, Taylor. It's so great to have you here with us today. Thank you. Also, so people know, Extremely Online is a book. Um, so yes. It's available for pre-order now. So. <laughs> Fantastic. And we'll put a, we will definitely put a pre-link, uh, a pre-order link in the podcast bio so folks can find it um, if easily. So first things first, let's talk a little bit more about your book. Um, there's so many books out there about the internet and social media already. What was it about your book that you were like, I still need to get this out? This is definitely, this, this is important to, yes. Hello. Did you lose the audio? Yeah, no, I'm losing you. You're like really pixelated. It's, you're breaking up, but it's okay. Uh, I think you're back now. Okay. So my question was, I'll back up one step. The question was, there are so many books out there about the internet and social media already, right? What is it, what, what was your experience where you were like, I need to write this book regardless, it's really important, no one else is, is doing this. What made you decide to write another? Yeah, well, no one has written a book about um, sort of the rise of the content creator industry. I mean, it's touched on, of course, in books. Um, I loved, you know, Mark Bergen's book on YouTube or Sarah Fryer's book on Instagram. And there's been a lot of sort of platform specific tech books on social media. Obviously, we have 150 Facebook books, um, but there hasn't been a lot of reporting that's really zoomed out and talked about tech, um, sort of the emergence of this whole ecosystem as a whole and um, talked about it from the user side. Often, you know, these books that are about social media are telling corporate narratives, right? So that's like sort of the story of Facebook as a business and how it emerged. My book is about how people use technology. So it's sort of how did we all become extremely online and how did this half a trillion dollar content creator industry emerge where the whole world is, you know, being shaped by online influence? How did online influence become sort of the most powerful form on, of online currency? And um, that's something that not only do not, I mean, there's just not a lot of tech reporters that even cover this um, topic, um, but yeah, no one had really sort of examined it from that lens. And I'm curious, so, you know, a lot of your work and reporting is about plat technology platforms, social media platforms. Um, you are yourself an online persona, right? With your own kind of personal brand. And I'm curious about how that, uh, shaped your experience of writing the book, researching the book? Like, how did your, the personal play into the, into the professional for you? Yeah, well, I am, I'm a nonfiction writer, so this book is not um, my personal story of the internet. I don't put myself in my work ever. Um, it's really based on um, reporting with, I mean, a couple thousand people, um, at least I talked to um, over the, the course of several years. Um, I talked to sort of executives at these platforms, but also huge influential content creators that really shaped the course of internet history that have really been sort of written out of the Silicon Valley narratives. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's very based on kind of um, deep reporting and a lot of the stories that I myself have broken over the years too, in regards to the end of Vine and, um, you know, how certain platforms have evolved in different ways. And 
um, how YouTubers have become so powerful. So it's kind of, I guess I would say the, the personal aspect is this is sort of like our collective history. Um, and I'm including right. myself in that of like, I think a lot of people will read the book and kind of, yeah, feel like a sense of nostalgia, like, oh my God, I remember that. Or I remember the dress or, you know, these viral moments. I talk a lot about like grumpy cat in my book, right? Like, yeah. but you kind of don't realize the underlying, yeah, the underlying like business story around it. For instance, grumpy cat, you know, built, it's it's still a multi-million dollar successful business and really paved the way for pet influencers, um, generations of them to come. So yeah, I think people will find it interesting and nostalgic, even if they themselves are not, you know, super online. And, you know, so you, you've d done this deep dive into creator history, essentially, and how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. But I think you also cover a lot of what some of the problems are with modern day creator history. Can you talk a little bit about that? Or ch not necessarily problems yeah, with, um, with, with creators themselves, but what are those, some of the challenges that creators are facing today? Yeah, so I mean, one thing I write about in this book is we have this half a trillion dollar industry um, where there's billions and billions of dollars sloshing around. Um, sponsored content is rampant. You know, people are building these multi million dollar brands on the internet. But there's absolutely no guardrails around any of it. All of this has emerged in the past two decades. Our entire notion of you know, fame and entertainment has changed. The media landscape has been upended. Um, but it's not totally clear kind of like where things will fall. And also um, just the exploitation that takes place you know, in this industry is, is off the charts. I mean, I've written a ton about kind of like the labor movement within the content creator world. And obviously it parallel, there's a lot of parallels with the gig economy where you have this kind of online app mediated work um, where people don't have any kind of benefits or support system. And it's an increasing number of people are sort of entering into this industry um, where you're not, yeah, there's, there's no support, there's no protections. I mean, if you're a child, huge amount of this industry is run on child labor, you know, kids making YouTube videos, kids participating in family, you know, vlogger videos growing up um, on the YouTube screen, like their parents recording their every move and them having no say over that. So it's just, it's a very messy landscape right now. And I think that people really need to understand the history of it and they need to understand, um, you know, the impact of it so that we can come up with sort of smart solutions. I'm not someone that thinks the whole industry needs to be like regulated. I think a lot of the government doesn't even know how to turn on their computer, but yeah. I do think that we need some um, some smart solutions for things like, you know, the fact that many creators aren't able to access healthcare or, um, you know, financial services. Uh, you know, they struggle to get uh, approved for credit cards, for instance, because they're technically freelance. So, um, yeah. So, okay, so if, if we're saying, all right, this needs this needs some guide rails, it, it needs some protections, but, maybe not from government, where should those protections come from? Because should they be from tech companies? And if so, how do you hold the platform companies responsible for something that's really not in their best interest? Like financially, you know? Well, I mean? companies do, yeah, a company do, companies do things all the time that are not in their best interest with public pressure. I think that's how you generally force companies to change. And I think that can often be far more effective than regulation. I think often there's a lot of bad tech regulation that happens because, again, we have this geriatric um, kind of class of people running the country that does not, un fundamentally does not understand technology. I mean, if you watch 10 minutes of the <laughs> TikTok hearing with the you know, TikTok CEO, you'll, you'll see that they just do not understand these platforms, much less the nuances of the content creator ecosystem that's you know, builds businesses on these platforms. So I think that pu the public needs a lot more awareness. The media, the traditional media needs to do more reporting. As I said, there's not many reporters on this beat. I mean, it's mostly women um, and it's still very maligned. Like people just, you know, people think of influencers as silly girls posting selfies and they don't understand this as like a labor issue. Um, and I think, you know, it's also so many problems in the tech world have been solved by creative entrepreneurs, you know, like, I think a lot of these problems, for instance, the financial services aspect, you know, I talked to this founder, Eric, I think his name is Eric Way, I'm trying to remember his last name. Uh, but Eric, you know, founded this company called Carrot, which actually just raised a massive amount of money from a bunch of VC funds. Um, and Carrot Financial is all about kind of helping creators, um, you know, manage their financial lives and, um, and, and have a normal financial life, you know, because they don't, like I said, they, they kind of are building these internet mediated businesses that have confusing business models and they can't just necessarily always get a credit card very easily. Um, 
so, you know, I think it's going to take, yeah, I think it's going to take innovation. I think it's going to take public pressure. But before any of that can happen, we need education. We need people to understand how this industry works and understand the origins of it so that they're not resolving, you know, the same types of uh, things that have already been discussed or worked through 10 years ago. So let's talk about that education piece. If you wanted, you know, if you were to tell people like, here are five things that you don't understand about what it's like to be a creator. What would those things yeah. be? What do you think people yeah, get wrong I mean, most of the time? I mean, I think the biggest misconception is just a complete like lack of um, understanding about how much work goes into these businesses. Uh, you know, these are media companies, these are modern media companies. And again, there's, because this industry was so built by women and pioneered by women on the internet, I talk about this in my book, but you know, the creator economy really started with mommy bloggers in the early 2010s, or sorry, early 2000s. Um, there's a lot of inherent misogyny in the way that people talk about the influencer industry or the creator economy. They, you know, again, it's back to this like lifestyle influencer just taking pictures and stuff. They don't see the level of work it takes. I mean, uh, content creators are essentially entrepreneurs building their own media businesses and running a media business as anyone even adjacent to media can tell you yes. is very hard. Um, it's very especially difficult. Especially when you're doing it on the back of these platforms, right? So um, I think there just needs to be a level of of respect, um, you know, to the people that built this industry and kind of have succeeded in it. I think men like Mr. Beast and David Dobrik get credited with a lot of stuff that, um, frankly, you know, beauty vloggers and other people were doing decades before them, you know, even just with Mr. Beast, you hear a lot of people in Silicon Valley saying, oh, you know, he's the first to productize himself, just ignoring the fact that like, makeup, <laughs> you know, beauty influencers did that for years with makeup lines. And yeah. um, a lot of this stuff is not new. Um, it's just that like Silicon Valley only kind of well, it's the truth, you know, um, just to the fact that like there is this rich history here and um, and a lot of, you know, a lot, I think because a lot of people in Silicon Valley that maybe weren't so creator adjacent, they sort of, you know, got into this hype cycle a couple of years ago where they were like throwing money at these startups that frankly had pursued sort of strategies that had already you know, been tried and failed. So I think to kind of understand the history, understand the pain points so that entrepreneurs can kind of build effective companies um, and, uh, you know, solve some of these problems. So uh, yeah, I just think the biggest misconception is just the, um, that it's not incredibly hard work and that these people are not sort of entrepreneurs. It's, it's much harder. I think everyone thinks, oh, I have a smartphone. I have TikTok. I can do it. It's like, right. I mean, have you seen Mr. Beast? Like he's, he has like 150 employees now. It's not easy to, you know, be really successful on the internet and maintain that success over time, maintain that brand over time. So I think one of the things, you know, you have these like very high end creators that are spending like Mr. Beast or spending like two and a half million on a, on a single video. Right. And then you have people who are just getting started and trying to work their way up. And I'm curious, you know, when you think about that life cycle, um, a lot of folks are like, I have no idea what to do, right? How do I move from here up to here? If, do you have, like, based on all of your research and are there things that you would, you recommend to kind of aspiring creators who want to be successful? I mean, have a business plan. Um, it, it seems so silly and I, it's crazy to me that more content creators sort of don't approach it the way. I think, I think a lot of content creators are really incredible, creative, interesting people. And they start on the internet. They know that the internet is this just powerful distribution system. So they start putting themselves online. They start making art online, being creative online, but they don't approach it necessarily from a strategic sort of standpoint of like, okay, how am I, you know, if I'm going to make this business plan, here's my five-year plan. Here's how it can take that money, reinvest it back in my business and, you know, work with that. I also think don't, don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, like we all require a little bit of outsourcing. There's this great guy, um, Patty. Oh my God, I forgot his name. Hold on. Let me look it up. Um, what is it? This is the magic of, of online podcasts. Oh, Patty Galloway. Patty yes. Galloway. Um, there's this great, yeah, there's these great, well, there's all these great creators actually out there that kind of give you advice on how to run your own creator business. There's Colin mm -hmm. and Samir on YouTube for a uh, just fantastic resource, I think, for aspiring creators. And then there's this guy, Patty Galloway, who's also just fantastic, a great newsletter kind of explaining how people build these businesses, really breaking them down. And he founded ytjobs.com for youtubejobs.com. 
Um, and ytjobs.com actually, you know, offers a sort of this marketplace for people to find things like thumbnail designers or freelance editors or, you know, motion graphics people so that you don't have to be Mr. Beast and employ a team of hundreds. You can kind of piece, you know, again, it's this freelance economy of like kind of hire one off things to kind of pump up some of your content. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you mentioned there are all of these, these people that have been left out of the history of the content world. Who are some of the unsung heroes that you find to be really inspiring or who have really pushed things forward in the creator world that don't get enough credit? Yeah, well, one, one person... Yeah, one person that I um, talked a lot about in my book is this woman, Julia Allison. And people might, you know, if they're a little bit older, might remember her because she was written about so often in Gawker back in the sort of the heyday of Gawker um, media in the late 2000s. Um, she was one of the first ever multi-platform influencers where she was posting on YouTube, Tumblr, she had her blog. She was... Um, she was she built this cult of personality around herself and monetized it and really saw the future before anyone else did she understood that to succeed on the internet you have to have a personal brand and you have to commodify yourself in certain ways and um she was talking about all of this in back in like 2006 2007 and she was maligned and um just viciously attacked by the media and it's so funny because just in researching the book the stuff that she's saying back in 2006 and seven ends up being what, you know, Mark Andreessen is saying in 2021 and 2022. And it's just so, you know, crazy how, um, you know, dismissive people are. And look, this is always the case with new ideas, right? They kind of, you've got those few people that sort of start, start out and mainstream the ideas. But I think there's just, especially because this industry was so, uh, is so female heavy. Um, and so much of it is around like women, like beauty and fashion, for instance, I talk about this in my book, are hu two huge categories that really embraced influencer online creator content early. And you had, um, you know, companies, wholesalers like Nordstrom's in uh, 2014, already doing these hugely successful lines where they would partner with influencers and kind of do the the back end, like help them design these lines and sell them and, and just making so much money off it. But I think because people don't sort of pay as much attention to those industries or they're not considered sort of serious they're still considered very feminine i think they're they're sort of you know people people forget about that stuff and they yeah. kind of forget how this industry emerged and they think it did start with david dobrik or something no hate to david dobrik he's you know a, very smart but um yeah, i think it's it's worth kind of like learning these lessons and seeing these business stories i talk so much again about like for someone like grumpy cat right it's like this cat that built the, the manager really the guy who manage that cat built it into this multinational brand that's still successful despite the fact that the cat itself died years ago you know so just i think in terms of creation of ip and on. brand and stuff it's really the interesting face, yes the mug the lives face on. lives forever in our memory <laughs> Yeah. All right. So I want to I want to talk a little bit more about platforms. You, you know, we've discussed a lot the creator economy, like some of the barriers to being a creator, what it what it takes to be a successful creator. Um, one of the things what we haven't talked about is is the platforms that house those creators, which at the end of the day have a huge amount of power in shaping who is successful, who is not successful. Yes. In your mind. Who are, which platforms are doing the best job to support creators authentically? Well, it's not even a question. Obviously, YouTube. I mean, YouTube is the one that pioneered this rev share monetization model. Um, I mean, YouTube literally, the, the team Next New Networks, which was an MCN that... Um, YouTube acquired back in 2011, they're the ones that, that pioneered the term creator for content creator in its modern usage. Um, prior to that, actually, content creators were called partners, YouTube partners. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called the YouTube partner program, actually. Um, and for a long time, the word creator itself was so synonymous with YouTube that if you were like a Viner or a TikTok or a Instagram person, you would actually identify with more platform specific language. Now creator is this agnostic term that's used for everything. But um, yeah, I mean, YouTube is just, YouTube offers the best and most stable form of monetization. However, I will say, you know, if you want to ask what platform is best for creators, it, it, you have to sort of think about it in different lenses. Best for creators in what way? YouTube, definitely the best for sustainable growth and monetization, but it's really, really hard to get subscribers on YouTube. Discovery is really bad on YouTube. and It's really hard to find new people. It's 
not great. So, uh, you know, I think for discovery um, and fame and attention um, and it's sort of entering in the cultural zeitgeist, TikTok is where it's at. I mean, TikTok is just where all the growth is happening. TikTok's where all the innovation is happening in terms of short form video. Um, I think TikTok is just, uh, you know, by far and away kind of where it's at these days in terms of cultural conversation and um, where creators get discovered. So, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of let's talk and, about and TikTok. then you got Meta in there on the side. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about let's talk oh. about TikTok because. Um, TikTok is very, you know, controversial from a national security perspective, which we also cover. TikTok is a very controversial platform, right? It's owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance, which is, if you know anything about Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party and its control on tech temp companies, there's not a lot of, you know, distance between their ability to impact ByteDance's choices. So I'm curious, you know, how you think about TikTok in relation to that and especially considering how China has been trying to manipulate Canadian elections and Canadian politicians. I don't know if you've been following this, but they've well, all kinds let's of coming out. Yeah, online. let's not for let's not forget how many times Facebook manipulated elections in other countries. I think it's you know there's absolutely zero evidence that TikTok has manipulated our elections or that China has ever interfered in any way in terms of the content that's delivered on TikTok um, to Americans like the CCP. There's just no evidence of that. We have absolutely no smoking gun. All of these, you know, nonsense sort of, um, there's a lot of inflammatory kind of commentary. And look, I get it. It's a Chinese owned company and China's an adversary. Um, but at the same time, if, if any of these people that were so allegedly concerned about TikTok actually cared about data privacy, they would be taking a look at Facebook and Google and all these other companies that harvest our data all day long. The, the bigger, the, the real problem is that we have absolutely no data privacy in this country. So yeah, you could ban TikTok and guess what? China can still get our data tomorrow from a third party data broker you know, that works with Facebook. So it's not like, there's just, there's no, there's no data privacy in this country. And I think TikTok is a convenient boogeyman, um, but it certainly is not even remotely the only Chinese owned social app in the store. And I think if we want to participate in this global economy, um, you know, we need to um, protect our data. And that doesn't necessarily mean running around like whack-a-mole trying to ban every new app that comes up. Um, because as we know, it's, you know, ever there's going to be a new app every few years. Um, we need we need real comprehensive data privacy reform. I want to push back on that a little bit though, because there is a difference between Facebook and and TikTok in that Facebook is not. You're right. I absolutely agree with you about data privacy reform. Number one, let's get that out of the way. But mm -hmm. Facebook is not beholden to an authoritarian dictator, right? Like who is killing millions. Well, of there's no evidence. Yeah, people. sure. Well, I mean, right, and the American government, who knows how many people, obviously, they're, you know, they're responsible for so many deaths, too. But I totally agree. I mean, I think, I think um, we don't have a smoking gun. If we had that, you know, it'd be different, but we just don't have evidence of that. What we do have evidence of is foreign adversaries leveraging platforms like Facebook to interfere in our democracy. And I think that's a big problem. And again, not saying that we shouldn't take a really hard look at TikTok, but that shouldn't be worth, that should just, that that's not the only thing we should look at. And I think, again, it's a very convenient scapegoat um, and, a, you know, and to, to not look at the rest of the ecosystem. We need to, we need to take a harder look and say like, you know, what role do these platforms play in kind of ex the rise of extremism? We've seen Facebook and YouTube and now X.com, Twitter, right? Like, I mean, they're directly funding, um, yeah. you know, far right extremists that have committed violence. And so we need to really take a look at all of these sort of platform manipulation issues. And again, I am not, I am not like a China apologist. I think like it is a pretty bad that the, you know, the most popular social app is owned by a foreign adversary. But I think um, just the sole focus on TikTok is a problem. And I think we're getting a taste of our own medicine a little bit because all you're right while you're right of course you know facebook is not controlled by the u.s government in the same way um facebook has allowed for a lot of you know really bad stuff and a lot of like you know sort of the de yeah. dismantling of democracy in a, yeah, a I lot totally of places agree. around the world they so were, i were, think they were instrumental like, in in you know in myanmar and and many other or like historical and recent 
So I, I, I'm with you on, I think we're, I think we're very much aligned on that. Like more broadly speaking, what we need is a much more, A, data protections, but also how do we keep these social platforms that creators are building their entire livelihoods on and we are spending so much time on from sorting us all out into little tiny silos of people who just, you know, think. I think it's, I mean, it's about what these platforms reward and incentivize. Mm -hmm. So many of these platforms realize that far right extremism plays really well, right? This is how, what we saw. I mean, I covered the 2016 election and saw how well, you know, Trump performed on the internet and um, a lot of kind of more extreme people, for instance, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. I mean, so much of that was sort of, mo that movement was mobilized on the internet and mobilized on these platforms that reward extremism. And right. sometimes extremism in both ways, but they do significantly, as we've seen the data prove out again and again, the far right is sort of particularly good at manipulating these platforms and these platforms reward that content. Look at what Elon, who Elon Musk is giving tens of thousands of dollars to, right? It's people like Andrew Tate. It's, um, you know, people that are, have sort of ties to the Nazi party. So. Um, we need, yeah, we need to kind of take a look at what these platform incentives are like and build more healthy, sustainable platforms that don't reward such, you know, just reward outrage. I completely agree. I have a tagline for this, uh, for, for users, not for creators, oh, but yeah. I, I think it's a good, it's a good note to end on, which is people, you know, I've done a lot of research and work on social media as well and misinformation and kind of like where, how it works and where it comes from. And people always ask me like, what is the one thing I can do? to fight back against information warfare and misinformation. And I was like, it's really simple. Don't become a cog in the outrage machine. Don't let, yes, when you yes. feel the anger and the frustration rise up inside you, do not automatically go on to do the next thing that you want to do. Take some time, sit, think about where this information came from. Think critically about why this person is posting this or what might be going on here. You can just scroll on by. I totally agree. And if you are going to get outraged, channel that outrage into something productive into, you know, looking at some of these reforms with these tech companies and, you know, l look at the system itself. Don't just yeah get mad at people on Twitter. <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right. Well, this this conversation will be continued in person in L.A. this fall. Um, I highly recommend you go out and order uh, Taylor's book ahead of time. I think we will probably have some uh, books available on site if you are attending the Future Interview Conference with us. Uh, but Taylor, I look forward to seeing you again in person in LA. Yes, can't wait.